All right. Uh, a reading from uh, Eschatological Optimism. I introduced the book in a previous video that I made. I want to read here from uh, where uh, Dario Dugina is talking here in a, a kind of an interview format, talking about the feminine principle and the problem of the subject and more uh, kind of acutely women and tradition. It gives us a, an interesting window into the idea of women and tradition, uh, kind of from this Russian traditionalist perspective. So uh, take what you want from it. I, I found it uh, interesting. Uh, and let's go ahead and, and get started. All right. Interlocutor Tim Kirby asks or states, the ball is really in Russians hands to show us what the family is going to look like, what relations between men and women are going to look like in the 21st century. Will Russia take that opportunity or just squander it? Well, well, we'll see. But what we can do is take a listen to Daria Platonova, who is a researcher of Orthodox feminism. She's going to tell us all about the true nature of feminism in Russia. Ms. Platonova, so roughly speaking, what are some type of the key differences between feminism in Russia and the West? Daria states, I've seen huge differences because it depends on the context of where I've been. In the West, there's a kind of process of secularization and religion is very, very far away from the state. So the problems of feminism are not at all connected with any religious topics. Kirby responds, it's important to know that Russia does not practice separation of church and state, but a symbiosis of church and state where the, enti where the entities remain separate but work together very often. That's an important nuance and one big difference between Russia and, say, America. Daria states, well, in Russia we have a very, inter a very interesting phenomenon where the context, the orthodox context, somehow influences even feminism. That means that all the topics which are broadly described in Western feminism, like the war of equality and the war for rights, and Russia have another degree. Because Russia is more traditional, it stays more traditional, and the influence of the Orthodox religion is much more complicated and interesting. So here we have a very interesting phenomenon the, in Russian feminism, which appeared with the name of Tatiana Gorcheva, and is called Christian feminism. Kirby responds, Tatiana Gorcheva, at the age of 26 during the height of the Cold War and communism in Russia, converted to Eastern Orthodoxy. She later founded the idea of Orthodox feminism and had to survive as a dissident in the 80s in the West. When the opportunity to come home arose in the 1990s, she came right back and is here to this very day. But unfortunately, there is very little, if anything, written about her in English, as about all good things that come out from Russia. Daria states, I think this sounds believable. It's very, very interesting to speak about this in the West because nobody can understand how religion, which according to the Western feminism is a way of instilling domination on women, can be connected with feminism, like it's two opposite sides, controversial concepts. Here in Russia, we have this version. Kirby states, that's interesting. Because in the West, it seems almost natural that femininity and Christianity are always at odds. But does this really have to be the case? Maybe they can actually work together and find some sort of middle ground. Daria. Actually, Tatiana Gorcheva herself notes that in Christianity, there is no hierarchical type, no hierarchy of woman and man. There's more dialogue between them. As she quotes the Bible, she says that there was Virgin Mary, really the prototype of women, and there was Christ, and there was no hierarchy between them. She gave birth to him. He is her son, and there was no inequality in this. There was balance. There were two worlds, the world of women and the world of man. Then Tatiana Gorcheva does an analysis of the biographies of women saints, and she finds there were a lot of women saints who had overcome the huge root of a great existential war, and that they are really similar to the way which was taken and overcome by men saints. She says there's a special role in Christian orthodoxy for women's suffering, and she thinks that there can be not only one world, like man's world, with women as a reduction of this world, but two worlds. Kirby responds, And here is the key point. When Western society moved from monarchy to liberalism, who got their rights first? White landowning men. They were the political actors, and everyone else was a non-actor. You know, kind of like how miners don't really have any responsibility today, or worse, in the case of slavery. 
But as time went on, other types of men, other ethnicities and non-landowning men, landowning men were sort of grouped into this male category as big political actors in society. Now, the interesting thing that happened was when women also wanted to be reflected by the law, by constitution, rather than having a separate entity and a separate nature for women, women shoved into the male category. So the interesting thing is when women did, the interesting thing is when women did get their rights, they didn't get their rights by raising women from the status of non-entity to a separate woman entity of equal value to men. But they essentially became men. That is probably where feminism took a very wrong turn and why there's so much desire among awful feminists today to essentially replace men, take the place of men, or just become men. So is this key oversight in the logic of, but that was a long time ago, about 100 years ago maybe, this key oversight and the concept of feminism really isn't relevant today, or is it? Daria responds, Simone de Beauvoir says that woman is another, an other She's the figure of another, and this another is created by man's world. And now women have to do a rev revolution against this man's world. This is Simone de Beauvoir, the so-called second wave feminism of history. But Tatiana Gorcheva notes that it is, a fant it is fantastic that women in quote unquote other, but she is not the other created by men. She is an other created by God. And here she points out that this other has a separate other world and there is no possibility to do a hierarchical type of hierarchization between men's and women's worlds because these worlds are different. Here Tatiana Gorcheva says that it can be based on the religion of Christianity. When it comes to God, man and woman are equal. But they are not equal in that woman has all the rights that man has. Or a man is not equal to a woman and he doesn't have the similar right to choose a woman has. There are two worlds and they don't cross. They are two separate worlds. Kirby responds, men and women being of equal value but completely different natures is ironically pretty traditional or pretty, pretty radical version of feminism for today's Western society. Daria, this idea has existed not only in Christian feminism but it also has been presented in standpoint feminism. It's not connected with religion. It is widely presented in the West. But here we have the main topic, that women's world has nothing in common with men's world. They are different. This is a very paradoxical thing because the idea is quite obvious. Really, they are different, even from consciousness, psychology, or even physical appearance. We are different. But the problem is that liberal feminism, the feminism which dominates the West, is focused on creating the equality of women and men up, even up to the era of having the same psychological and physical appearance, like the Andrew androgen figure is making the real equality of women and men becoming true. Kirby responds, the current trend of androgyny while forcing men to be sort of wishy-washy and passive while praising women who are strong bosses has really confused Western society. It's kind of like we're all square pegs being forced into round holes. Why should we do this and why is this not happening in Russia, which is open to all the big cool trends in Hollywood movies? Why does Russia have some sort of weird immunity to this? Daria, well, for Russia, uh, that's a very interesting case because when we watch how feminism has been developing in the world, we see that in Russia, women's suffrage was accepted in 1906. So in the beginning of the 20th century, while in France, we have, we have it from 1944. This is an incredible situation. That means that we have already lived in the feminist world, and now we go to the new strategy of this Christian feminism, orthodox feminism. As for Russia today, contemporary Russia, I think we are still trying to cope with the West, copy the West. We still try to be as liberal as the West is, even if in geopolitics we have a little bit of the course to multi multipolarity, but still we are in this world where there is a men's domination and women is some kind of other created by man. So I don't think we have already overcome this liberal feminism in Russia. I just think we are still in the trap. We still exist in the liberal paradigm. But we need to always understand that Russia ha was in the avant-garde of the feminist battle, and today we have a regression to the liberals, to this liberalism. So we had a Soviet avant-garde, cyborg-like feminism, with the idea of the real resistance of women against the bourgeoisie, liberal landlords, and totalitarian hegemony. And now we are somehow softening our discourse to the liberal model, 
which is regress. And at the same time, we have this Christian feminism, which is, which is appearing. Kirby says, but why did Russian women themselves, not under coercion, willfully choose to reject the feminism? Darius says, well, actually, I think it's because of the context. We are more classical and maybe here uh, women decided to be a kind of saviors of the patriarchy. Maybe they started to feel that men are losing a bit of the wheel and they decided to be the patriarchal saviors. Maybe this is an explanation. At the same time, the thing is that Russia was communist more in the geopolitical way, and I'm not sure that we can say that we had this cultural Marxism. The West is not suffering from communism now. As far as I've analyzed the conservative media in the United States, I see a lot of anti-communist speeches, but these are not anti-communist, but more anti-cultural Marxist. We had a communism, which was mainly the economic direction of communism or socialism, uh, but this communist politics, we didn't have it a lot. And we didn't have this focus on feminism, on the rights of LGBTQ and all that is happening now in the West. So our communism was really different. Kirby states, interesting, but then why does Russia, a formerly Marxist nation, seem to be immune to the effects of cultural Marxism. Daria, there is even the possibility that communism could never exist in Russia, but that it could only exist in the form of Christian socialism. The thing is that our mentality didn't accept communism as it was in the West, so we did a small re-editing of that. The thing is that for now, for Russians, it's quite interesting to see the cyborg feminists which can exist in the communist parties and are for the destruction of the woman while we don't see communism as the destruction of women. Kirby, in closing, are there any key differences between the mentalities of today's Western and Russian women and their desires, hope, dreams, and political views? Daria finally says, I just think we don't have this obsession of fighting men. And I think we like dialogue and harmony between men and women. We think that when a guy is helping you in the street with handling something, maybe a big suitcase, that is not a kind of domination on us. It's a kind of help and this is normal that means a person helps us in this way and we help men in another way if it's a family then we create a psychological balance we help with our quote-unquote kitchen magic you know there exists such a kind of magic you can even find books now in the west which write about the garden uh, the garden which our kitchen which even calling it a witch so we are helping in all these different ways, and I think in Russia, this idea of a dialogue between the two women and men is very widely accepted. While in the West, the dialogue of man and woman causes a problem, because women in the West have already, already have the problem that they can be dominated by men. They will be dominated by men, and that they have this theme in their heads, and they don't create a dialogue, but a war. Feminism in the West is concentrated on the war against men, while Russian feminism, as I see it, and my friends see it, is concentrated on the happiness of women. Women in the West who are fighting for their rights and receiving them are not happy because they live in a paradigm in which there's no dialogue, only nonstop war. They become instrumentalized women. The problem is that the West has politicized the phenomena of women. Liberal feminism is trying to instrumentalize and make one unique woman, but there is multiple women. If we are to create feminism, then we need to take, we need to make a multipolar feminism where all the women of all the countries have the right to speak. I think there is a permanent dialogue and war between men and women, and I don't think that it must be eliminated. In this war, there is the construction of both. So if we win this war, that will mean that both will, that both will end because there will be no dynamic. Victory is in dialogue in a soft way like tango. The dance of tango is a very good example because on the one hand it's aggressive and on the other hand it's a love story. It's a compromise. These worlds will never be the same, so the war of one against the other will not create, will not create one world, but will create two destroyed worlds as it is in the West. When women fights against man, she destroys man, and then there is no more women and no more man. All right, that's the end of it. There's another section here that maybe I'll get into. Um, it's entitled uh, The War of the Sexes, Gender and Tradition, uh, the Creation of the Universe. Uh, so I hope you guys like it. Um, let me know, and I'll uh, see if I can uh, get another chapter read for you guys. So God bless.